the beach. Marty Gutierrez sat on the beach and watched the afternoon sun fall lower in the sky until it sparked harshly on the water of the bay and its rays reached beneath the palm trees to where he sat among the mangroves on the beach of Cabo Blanca. As best he could determine, he was sitting near the spot where the American girl had been two days before. Although it was true enough, as he had told the Bowmans, that lizard bites were common, Gutierrez had never heard of a basilisk lizard biting anyone. And he had certainly never heard of anyone being hospitalized for a lizard bite. Then, too, the bite radius on Tina's arm appeared slightly too large for a basilisk. When he got back to the Carrara station, he had checked the small research library there, but found no reference to basilisk lizard bites. Next, he checked the International Biosciences Services, a computer database in America, but he found no references to basilisk bites or hospitalization for lizard bites. He then called the medical officer in Amaloya, who confirmed that a nine-day-old infant sleeping in its crib had been bitten on the foot by an animal the grandmother, the only person actually to see it, claimed was a lizard. Subsequently, the foot had become swollen and the infant had nearly died. The grandmother described the lizard as green with brown stripes. It had bitten the child several times before the woman frightened it away. Strange, Gutierrez had said. No, like all the others, the medical officer replied, adding that he had heard of other biting incidents. A child in Vasquez, the next village of the coast, had been bitten while sleeping, and another in Puerto Cetrero. All these incidents had occurred in the last two months. All had involved sleeping children and infants. Such a new and distinctive pattern led Gutierrez to suspect the presence of a previously unknown species of lizard. This was particularly likely to happen in Costa Rica. Only 75 miles wide at its narrowest point, the country was smaller than the state of Maine. Yet, within its limited space, Costa Rica had a remarkable diversity of biological habitats. Sea coasts on both the Atlantic and the Pacific, four separate mountain ranges, including 12,000-foot peaks and active volcanoes, rainforests, cloud forests, temperate zones, swampy marshes, and arid deserts. Such ecological diversity sustained an astonishing diversity of plant and animal life. Costa Rica had three times as many species of birds as all of North America, more than a thousand species of orchids, more than 5,000 species of insects. New species were being discovered all the time, at a pace that had increased in recent years, for a sad reason. Costa Rica was becoming deforested, and as a jungle species lost their habitats, they moved to other areas, and sometimes changed behavior as well. So a new species was perfectly possible. But along the excitement of a new species was the worrisome possibility of new diseases. Lizards carried viral diseases, including several that could be transmitted to man. The most serious was central saurian encephalitis, or CSE, which caused a form of sleeping sickness in human beings and horses. Gutierrez felt it was important to find this new lizard, if only to test it for disease. Sitting on the beach, he watched the sun drop lower and sighed. Perhaps Tina Bowman had seen a new animal, and perhaps not. Certainly Gutierrez had not. Earlier that morning, he had taken the air pistol, loaded the clip with ligamine darts, and set out for the beach with high hopes. But the day was wasted. Soon he would have to begin the drive back up the hill from the beach. He did not want to drive that road in darkness. Gutierrez got to his feet and started back up the beach. Farther along, he saw the dark shape of a howler monkey ambling along the edge of the mangrove swamp. Gutierrez moved away, stepping out toward the water. If there was one howler, there would probably be others in the trees overhead, and howlers tended to urinate on intruders. But this particular howler monkey seemed to be alone and walking slowly and pausing frequently to sit on its haunches. The monkey had something in its mouth. As Gutierrez came closer, he saw it was eating a lizard. The tail and the hind legs drooped from the monkey's jaws. Even from a distance, Gutierrez could see the brown stripes against the green. Gutierrez dropped to the ground and aimed the pistol. The howler monkey, accustomed to living in a protected reserve, stared curiously. He did not run away, even when the first dart whined harmlessly past him. When the second dart struck deep in the thigh, the howler shrieked in anger and surprise, dropping the remains of its meal as it fled into the jungle. Gutierrez got to his feet and walked forward. He wasn't worried about the monkey. The tranquilizer dose was too small to give it anything but a few minutes of dizziness. Already he was thinking of what to do with his new find. Gutierrez himself would write up the preliminary report, but the remains would have to be sent back to the United States for final positive identification, of course. 
To whom should he send it? The acknowledged expert was Edward H. Simpson, Emeritus Professor of Zoology at Columbia University in New York, an elegant older man with swept back white hair. Simpson was the world's leading authority on lizard taxonomy. Probably, Marty thought, he would send this lizard to Dr. Simpson. New York. Dr. Richard Stone, head of the Tropical Diseases Laboratory of Columbia University Medical Center, often remarked that the name conjured up a grander place than it actually was. In the early 20th century, when the laboratory occupied the entire fourth floor of the Biomedical Research Building, crews of technicians worked to eliminate the scourges of yellow fever, malaria, and cholera. But medical successes and research laboratories in Nairobi and Sao Paulo had left the TDL a much less important place than it once was. Now a fraction of its former size, it employed only two full-time technicians, and they were primarily concerned with diagnosing illnesses of New Yorkers who had traveled abroad. The lab's comfortable routine was unprepared for what it received that morning. Oh, very nice, the technician in the Tropical Diseases Laboratory said, as she read the customs label. Partially masticated fragment of unidentified Costa Rican lizard. She wrinkled her nose. This one's all yours, Dr. Stone. Richard Stone crossed the lab to inspect the new arrival. Is this the material from Ed Simpson's lab? Yes, she said, but I don't know why they'd send a lizard to us. His secretary called. Simpson's on a field trip in Borneo for the summer. And because there's a question of communicable disease with this lizard, she asked our lab to take a look at it. Let's see what we've got. The white plastic cylinder was the size of a half-gallon milk container. It had locking metal latches and a screw top. It was labeled International Biological Specimen Container and plastered with stickers and warnings in four languages. The warnings were intended to keep the cylinder from being opened by suspicious customs officials. Apparently the warnings had worked. As Richard Stone swung the big light over, he could see the seals were still intact. Stone turned on the air handlers and pulled on plastic gloves and a face mask. After all, the lab had recently identified specimens contaminated with Venezuelan equine fever. Japanese bee encephalitis, Kayasanura forest virus, Langit virus, and Mayaro. Then he unscrewed the top. There was a hiss of escaping gas, and white smoke boiled out. The cylinder turned frosty cold. Inside, he found a plastic Ziploc sandwich bag containing something green. Stone spread a surgical drape on the table and shook out the contents of the bag. A piece of frozen flesh struck the table with a dull thud. Huh, the technician said. Looks eaten. Yes, it does, Stone said. What do they want with us? The technician consulted the enclosed documents. Lizard is biting local children. They have a question about identification of the species and a concern about diseases transmitted from the bite. She produced a child's picture of a lizard, signed Tina at the top. One of the kids drew a picture of the lizard. Stone glanced at the picture. Obviously, we can't verify the species, Stone said, but we can check diseases easily enough if we can get any blood out of this fragment. What are they calling this animal? Basiliscus amaratus with three-toed genetic anomaly, she said, reading. Okay, Stone said. Let's get started. While you're waiting for it to thaw, do an x-ray and take Polaroids for the record. Once we have blood, start running antibody sets until we get some matches. Let me know if there's a problem. Before lunchtime, the lab had its answer. The lizard blood showed no significant reactivity to any viral or bacterial antigen. They had run toxicity profiles as well, and they had found only one positive match. The blood was mildly reactive to the venom of the Indian king cobra. But such cross-reactivity was common among reptile species, and Dr. Stone did not think it noteworthy to include in the facts his technician sent to Dr. Martin Gutierrez that same evening. There was never any question about identifying the lizard. That would await for the return of Dr. Simpson. He was not due back for several weeks, and his secretary asked if the TDL would please store the lizard fragment in the meantime. Dr. Stone put it back in the Ziploc bag and stuck it in the freezer. Martin Gutierrez read the facts from the Columbia Medical Center, Tropical Diseases Laboratory. It was brief. Subject, Basiliscus amaratus with genetic anomaly. Forwarded from Dr. Simpson's office. Materials. Posterior segment? Partially eaten animal? Procedures performed. X-ray. Microscopic. Immunological RTX for viral. 
parasitic bacterial disease. Findings No histologic or immunologic evidence for any communicable disease in man in this Basiliscus amirata sample. Signed, Richard A. Stone, M.D., Director. Gutierrez made two assumptions based on the memo. First, that his identification of the lizard as basilisk had been confirmed by scientists at Columbia University. And second, that the absence of communicable disease meant that the recent episodes of sporadic lizard bites implied no serious health hazards for Costa Rica. On the contrary, he felt his original views were correct, that a lizard species had been driven from the forest into a new habitat and was coming into contact with village people. Gutierrez was certain that in a few more weeks the lizards would settle down and the biting episodes would end. The tropical rain fell in drenching sheets, hammering the corrugated roof of the clinic in Bahia Anazco. It was nearly midnight. Power had been lost in the storm, and the midwife, Elena Morales, was working by flashlight when she heard a squeaking, chirping sound. Thinking that it was a rat, she quickly put a compress on the forehead of the mother and went into the next room to check on the newborn baby. As her hand touched the doorknob, she heard the chirping again, and she relaxed. Evidently, it was just a bird, flying in the window to get out of the rain. Costa Rican said that when a bird came to visit a newborn child, it brought good luck. Elena opened the door. The infant lay in a wicker bassinet, swaddled in a light blanket, only its face exposed. Around the rim of the bassinet, three dark green lizards crouched like gargoyles. When they saw Elena, they cocked their heads and stared curiously at her, but did not flee. In the light of her flashlight, Elena saw the blood dripping from their snouts. Softly chirping, one lizard bent down, and with the quick shake of its head, tore a ragged chunk of flesh from the baby. Elena rushed forward, screaming, and the lizards fled into the darkness. But long before she reached the bassinet, she could see what happened to the infant's face, and she knew the child must be dead. The lizard scattered into the rainy night, chirping and squealing, leaving behind only bloody, three-toed tracks, like birds. The Shape of the Data Later, when she was calmer, Elena Morales decided not to report the lizard attack. Despite the horror she had seen, she began to worry that she might be criticized for leaving the baby unguarded. So, she told the mother that the baby had asphyxiated, and she reported the death on the form she sent to San Jose as SIDS, Sudden Infant Death Syndrome. This was a syndrome of unexplained death among very young children. It was unremarkable, and her report went unchallenged. The university lab in San Jose that analyzed the saliva sample from Tina Bowman's arm made several remarkable discoveries. There was, as expected, a great deal of serotonin, but among the salivary proteins was a real monster, molecular mass of 1,980,000, one of the largest proteins known. Biological activity was still under study, but it seemed to be a neurotoxic poison related to cobra venom, although more primitive in structure. The lab also detected trace quantities of the gamma amino methionine hydrolase, because this enzyme was a marker for genetic engineering and not found in wild animals, technicians assumed it was a lab contaminant and did not report it when they called Dr. Cruz, the referring physician in Punta Arenas. The lizard fragment rested in the freezer at Columbia University, awaiting the return of Dr. Simpson, who was not expected for at least a month. And so things may have remained, had not a technician named Alice Levin walked into the Tropical Diseases Laboratory, seen Tina Bowman's picture, and said, Oh, whose kid drew the dinosaur? What? Richard Stone said, turning slowly toward her. The dinosaur, isn't that what it is? My kid draws them all the time. This is a lizard, Stone said, from Costa Rica. Some girl down there drew a picture of it. No, Alice Levin said, shaking her head. Look at it. It's very clear. Big head, long neck, stands on its hind legs, thick tail. It's a dinosaur. It can't be. It was only a foot tall. So? There were little dinosaurs back then, Alice said. Believe me, I know. I have two boys. I'm an expert. The smallest dinosaurs were under a foot. Teenysaurus or something. I don't know. Those names are impossible. You'll never learn those names if you're over the age of ten. You don't understand, Richard Stone said. This is a picture of a contemporary animal. 
They sent us a fragment of the animal. It's in the freezer now. Stone went and got it and shook it out of the baggie. Alice Levin looked at the frozen piece of leg and tail and shrugged. She didn't touch it. I don't know, she said, but that looks like a dinosaur to me. Stone shook his head. Impossible. Why? Alice Levin said. It could be a leftover or a remnant or whatever they call them. Stone continued to shake his head. Alice was uninformed. She was just a technician who worked in the bacteriology lab down the hall. And she had an active imagination. Stone remembered the time when she thought she was being followed by one of the surgical orderlies. You know, Alice Levin said, if this is a dinosaur, Richard, it could be a big deal. It's not a dinosaur. Has anybody checked it? No, Stone said. Well, take it to the Museum of Natural History or something, Alice Levin said. You really should. I'd be embarrassed. You want me to do it for you, she said? No, Richard Stone said, I don't. You're not going to do anything? Nothing at all. He put the baggie back in the freezer and slammed the door. It's not a dinosaur. It's a lizard. And whatever it is, it can wait until Dr. Simpson gets back from Borneo to identify it. That's final, Alice. This lizard's not going anywhere.